go every every country I've been to, at least in the Western world. At Christmas time, the thing that most strikes you is the lights, right? Everything is full of lights. I like lights. We just put lights, though, but we did it with batteries. So I noticed last night that the batteries had dead, uh, died, so we had no more lights. But lights are part of Christmas, aren't they? You know something? Lights are indeed, even biblically speaking, connected to Christmas or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a really great prophecy that links the coming of the Son, the coming of Jesus, and the light. And this is in the... Okay, that's our sermon today, Light for Life. Try to say that about 10 times without making your uh, tongue get tangled, right? Your tongue get tangled, whatever. Uh, light for life, right? Or life, light for, I got it wrong. <laughs> light for life, all right. I'd have you all say with me, but you're not supposed to speak right now, okay? Good. There's a prophecy, very famous prophecy in the, in the book of Isaiah, or Isaiah, as the Isaiah, as the Brits say. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. That's verse 2. And then in verse 6 we read, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, notice here. The light has come, the darkness has seen a great light for, and the for here means because, okay? Because a son is given. Because the Lord Jesus has come, there is light given, all right? And so light and Christmas, or Jesus' birth, are indeed connected. And we want to look more at this, this, this matter of Christ being the light. And so we want to ask a question this, morning, this afternoon, which is simply, what does it mean that Jesus is the light of the world, okay? Well, it means, first of all, obviously, that the, work, the world must be in darkness, right? The world is in darkness. Notice these two phrases from the passages we just read. The people who walked in what? In darkness. Again, another phrase. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness. The Bible stresses time and time again that many, many people live in darkness. The question is, what is it like to live in darkness? Well, have you ever been in a situation where you couldn't see a, couldn't even see your finger this close, where everything was just pitch black? I'm sure you have. When I, we first came to Hamburg, this is way back, the end of the 1980s. You we heard the 80s and 90s, part of the 80s and 90s. So we left for many years, but uh, we lived in a one of these Altbau Wohnungen, these old buildings, and had a everybody had a uh, in the keller in the, in the basement that had storage rooms. And so one night we had just gotten there. I didn't know the building very well. And I went downstairs for some reason or other to our cellar. But just as I got down to the bottom of the stairs in the kella, the basement, the lights went off. And it was absolutely pitch black. And, I, and, and the problem was, you know, in Germany, they do, they do a good thing. They put, there's a light. And if the light goes off, the middle of the light turns on red. Ever see that? So you know where you go, right? Well, folks, <laughs> just my luck. In the basement, that had burnt out the red light, okay? So there I was, and, he, I, and I honestly did not know which way to go, right? And there were several ways to go, right? It was musty and kind of weird down there. And um, I was kind of feeding my way along the, the, the walls, trying to feel where there might be kind of a light or something. It was weird, man. It was weird. And you begin to think of all kinds of strange things, right? There I am, lost in the kella. That'd be a good, that'd be a good film title, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be, right? <laughs> or lost in the basement. Doesn't sound very exciting. Well, well, put yourself in my place, okay? How would you have felt if you had been caught in the dark down there in the basement? Let me give you some of my own experiences uh, reactions that, that night. First of all, you might feel disoriented like I felt disoriented. What should I do now? <laughs> Where should I go, right? You try your best to peer into the dark and you can't see a blooming thing, nothing. And you know, a sense of being disoriented, of not knowing which way to go, is an experience that so many people have. 
uh, reminds me of this verse that we see in John 12, 45, the man who walks in darkness and is talking here, not so much about physical darkness, is talking about kind of the darkness of the soul, right? When we don't really have things clear in our, in our hearts, in our lives, then he says, he does not know where he is going. This is one of the experiences of living in the darkness. And sometimes, you know, living in the darkness and not having orientation, being disoriented, uh, also means that we choose the wrong way, right? We choose the wrong roads, that wrong paths. That night, I went the wrong way. Later, I said, I went the other wrong way, right? I went everywhere I should go except the way I should have gone to find the light switch. The same thing happens to us. In fact, it says here in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to man. Ah, oh, let's go this way. I think that probably the, 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 the light switch is over here, right? And it's back over there, but anyway, right? But in the end, it leads to death. Many people search for direction in their lives. We could say they're looking for meaning in their lives, right? And they look for it in so many different places, in religion, in activities, in, in success. So you could go on and on. In the end, they don't really find it. They continue feeling disoriented. It reminds me of the, one of the most famous kings of the Old Testament, Solomon. He tried all these things also. He was actually disoriented. He thought, if I go this way, I'll find happiness, I'll find meaning, if I go that way. But at the end, we say we see that all was vanity and striving after wind, says in Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 11. Okay, disoriented. Another feeling when you're in the basement, right? The light goes off. Oh, there you are. There's a feeling of being what? Lonely. You know, the worst thing is down there, you know, you are alone, right? If, if my mama was there, I'd hold her hand, right? And my wife, she, 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 she always figures things out. I was alone <laughs> in the guts of the earth, it felt like anyway, right? And no one could see me or hear me. And there I was all alone. You know, loneliness is the result of spiritual darkness. Look at what it says here in Ephesians chapter 4. I can easily read here for me. Paul talks about people in the futility of their thinking, living in this way, says they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, a dark lifestyle he's talking about here. People trying to feel their emptiness or their loneliness. You know, often we, feel, we, we find ourselves maybe uh, uh, spending lots of time with our smartphone or maybe surfing. We're trying to feel time, right? I mean, life is pretty boring, right? Or we feel pretty, pretty, pretty alone often, and so we feel our time in that way. And there is that continual dissatisfaction and loneliness. Sociologists say that loneliness is one of the characteristics of the modern world. In fact, uh, often we find lonely people where we would least expect it. In fact, have you ever been to a party? Lots of people, right? You know, boom, 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 boom. And you felt lonely? I've had that experience, right? Everybody around was so happy, but really, you're not really happy, right? Bring on the beer, whatever, to, to, to feel happy. But, but there also, I remember once a, a, a young man that I was discipling, he had a girlfriend, and he said, you know, I told my mother, you know, Mom, I, I, I have this girlfriend I like, but I, I still feel lonely. And her answer was, son, you will always feel lonely in marriage. Oh, well, shall we all get married? <laughs> wow. Well, folks, it's true. If a marriage is not based upon Jesus Christ and both, remember I always talk about a triangle, God at the top and both are here. The partner is going toward God. They draw closer and closer to one another. If you don't have that, well, you get used to each other, right? And the loneliness can be there, uh, of course. In fact, I was reading about George Clooney. You all know who George Clooney is? Okay. You should, right? We're such informed people. You know that he has bouts of loneliness. He talks about that. In fact, he says the following thing. He says, anyone would be lying if they said they didn't get lonely at times. The loneliest you get is in the most public of arenas. You will go to a place and end up in the smallest compartment possible. Because it's a, it's a distraction to everybody, and you end up not getting to enjoy it like everyone else. That is, you go someplace, and everybody wants to talk to you. You have to kind of withdraw, right? And there are people around you, but you're not really interacting, so you feel lonely. 
even George Clooney. My good, my, my good, what hope do I have, Henry? Right? My goodness. Okay, so disoriented, then we feel lonely, but also I felt, I must admit it, folks, here's the big pastor, right? I felt fearful. <laughs> you know, when the lights go out in the cellar, our heart starts to beat faster, right? In fact, in fact folks, I did feel weird. I really did. Uh, you know, almost a little on the edge of panic after I'd been trying for about 10 minutes to get out of there. This went on, okay? And I couldn't get out of the cellar. Uh, I did feel a bit fearful. You know, you wonder, wh what's around the corner, right? What if I never get out of here? And you know something, what was funny is that I realized later, of course, when I got to know the building better, I, I kept hearing these weird sounds. I really did. It was like, Man, I was spooked. Mama. But I realized that the, the, the furnace, you know, the heights of about the room was right there, okay? And, you know, you don't know that. You're hearing all these weird things, and you're already kind of spooked and afraid and alone. Man, that, <laughs> you know, all your heroism goes out the window, right? But, you know, there are so many fears in life when you live in spiritual darkness. There's a danger of failure, of sickness. Of course, now, for example, in the pandemic, but not just that, right? We are afraid of losing on our, losing our, uh, losing our jobs. Uh, many of us just are afraid of people. I've talked to so many people in counseling who are afraid of people. That's why I think this verse is interesting. It says, fear of man will prove to be a snare or a trap to fear people, right? Well, those, that's one of the fears that control people. Uh, another fear, which we all know is a fear of death, right? Very common, although many don't admit that. Hebrews 2.15 talks about the fact that, uh, talks of those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear. That's what, that's what slavery does. That is the, a fear, uh, a fear which is what slavery does. And I think deep, deep down inside, we often have a sense that you know, we, we know we're someday going to stand before God, and that's why it says here also in John, it says, fear has to do with punishment. Ooh, you know, we don't know what's coming, right? You know, as a child, I hated to be in the dark. As you know, I grew up in Mexico City, and it wasn't too safe. In fact, it was very safe compared to what it is today. <laughs> but we had several break-in attempts. Does anybody have had a break-in attempt where you're at home and somebody tries to get into your home? Probably not too many, right? Folks, we had several. Okay, but now that I woke up and there was a guy above my, there's a little window above my bed trying to get in. I was so petrified I couldn't even scream, right? And so when the lights went out, I felt especially in the darkness, right? Afraid and disoriented and alone and so forth. And, and in Mexico City back then, whenever it rained, not whenever, but very often when it rained, what happened? The lights went out, right? And if I happened to be alone, man, it was really pretty bad. I really didn't like it at all. So the fear would kind of control me. You know, perhaps you feel in the dark today. You're not sure which way you're going. You're disoriented. Maybe you really realize that you need to come out of the basement. That is, you're living in this, this darkness, not knowing where you're going. Things are uncertain, and you're looking for the light. And that's a good thing. Well, our second insight today, there's only two, will help us to find an answer. So, again, we're asking what we learn from Christ being the light. And the second one of these, the answers is, the second answer is that there is a way out of our darkness, okay? That's why he's the light, right? He's there giving us a way out of our darkness. Okay. We'll go back to Isaiah 9-2, which is talking about the coming of Christ. And here's something wonderful happened. Okay, the people, those who are in darkness, right, those who are kind of trying to get out of the basement, right, it says, they have seen a great light. On them, light has shone, or on them has light shone. Okay, so there I was, stumbling along, feeding my way along the wall. And, you know, imagine what would have happened had a neighbor come in you know, the entryway upstairs, there was a door that would go right down into the keller, into the, the basement. And if a, if, if a guy had come in or had come down, one of the neighbors, and had just decided also to go down to the basement and had turned the light on, 
at the top of the stairs. Well, all of a sudden, light would have just inundated everything, right? Light would have shown, ah, the solution to my problems, hallelujah, right? Would have been wonderful. It didn't happen, but it would have been wonderful. Well, actually, this is precisely the idea here that we see in this text. The light bursts into the world, overcoming the darkness. Jesus, the light of the world, drives darkness back. And that's why we read in John 8, 12, it says, I am the light of the world, said Jesus. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Okay? The light goes on. You're in the dark. Light. Whoa, light! And when we understand the background of this verse, John 8, 12, it's really interesting. This was given at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it went on for several days. And on the first night of the festivity or festival of tabernacles, they had what was called the yeah, ceremony they called the illumination of the temple. In the court of women, they would set up, set up four huge candelabra. And again, don't forget, they didn't have any public lighting, right? In a city like Jerusalem, at night it was dark. And at a certain moment, they would light those candelabra. And it said that the light was so bright that it would illuminate every courtyard in the entire city. The blaze was just impressive. Once a year, this happened, and people never forgot it. Well, Jesus is saying, you have, again, that's the background, right? And so Jesus here is saying, you have just seen the blaze that is, that, that is set forth by the candelabra. He says, Folks, I am the light of the world. And for those who follow me, there will be light, not just one night at a festival, but for life, for eternity. I am the light of the world. So Jesus is the light that illumines our darkness. But, but what does darkness mean exactly? Well, if his presence gives spiritual light, then... The darkness he overcomes must also be spiritual darkness, right? And so, really, spiritual darkness is the equivalent of the absence of God in our lives. And that's what we're talking about here. Did you know that the Bible says that people walk in darkness because they don't believe in Jesus? It says that people are separated from God. That's Ephesians 4.18. That is, yeah, we don't have contact with God. We were made to live in communion with God. We were made to live actually in light, in the light of God's presence, in the glory of God's presence. Remember that verse, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? That's his light. It's your kind of glory. We were made for that, but because we have sinned, we fall, fall uh, far short of that. So people are separated from God. In fact, it says in, 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 in the Isaiah, it says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. The one who should be your God, in a way, right? There's, 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 there's separation because of sin. And so people love or live in sin because they hang on to their darkness, and that separates them from God. You know, we may think that sin refers to some of these gross things that people do, but sin is actually anything you do that doesn't measure up to God's standards. Jesus said, be perfect as your Father is perfect. If you're not perfect, then that's sin. I remember, I've heard, well, I've heard people many times say, well, I'm not perfect, but, right? And I almost want to say, amen. <laughs> but uh, I'm not perfect, but, as if, you could even possibly be the most remotely perfect, right? Of course we're not perfect. We're far from perfect. In fact, here I'd like to get an amen, right? Don't give it to me, right? <laughs> it says, all have sinned. Again, what we just, uh, the, the verse we just gave, and fall short of the glory of God. Again, we're made for that glory. Only in God's presence, in that glory for which we were made to be engulfed, do we feel fulfilled. In that light, do we feel fulfilled. But we fall short of that because our iniquities separate us from God. So how do we overcome our predicament? 
Again, we want to go back to John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What does it mean to follow him? Of course, it means to understand what he has done and what he offers us and to accept that, right? Jesus came to take your sin upon himself, the very thing that separates you from God. That's why he came to this earth. And so, at Christmas time, it's a wonderful time to remember what Jesus has actually done for us coming to this earth. The wages of sin is death. And that means eternal separation from God. But the gift of life that we get through Jesus Christ uh, 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 is uh, eternal life, right? That's, that's what the Bible teaches. So, what we need to do, dear people, is to accept light except Jesus, who is the light. But you know, to do that, we must admit that we are in darkness. In Matthew 4, people saw the light, but you know, they didn't want to face the reality of their darkness. That's a very important point. I find so often that people don't want to acknowledge that they need a Savior. And if I'm going to be able to take hold of the light of the world, I need to follow Jesus. In other words, admit, I need to follow you. I need Jesus. And that's the key to all these things. Now imagine that, again, I'm in the, in the, in the cellar, right, in the basement. You're not going to forget this illustration, right? Pastor Dan once was in an old building that had a kella, right? <laughs> anyway, there I am in the cellar. And imagine somebody comes, I hear, I hear a neighbor or somebody came into the building, okay? Now, the way the thing was set up, there's a stairway upstairs, and it, you, you could hear, it's just right underneath the entrance, part of the kella. So somebody comes in, you can hear the steps. I could have simply yelled and said, please, help me, right? Turn on the light. And the person would have said, huh, oh, okay, you know, bonk, you know, the thing would have gone on. But, but perhaps I would have thought, how embarrassing. He's going to think that this old guy can't figure out how to get out of the keller. <laughs> I mean, come on. I'm a big boy, right? I, I, I can handle my own stuff. And then because of my pride, I don't say anything. So there I, there I continue trying to find my way out of the cellar, right? Well, I think this is the way many people are today. Incidentally, I should tell you, this is the last story of the, of the cellar. I did get out. How? I'll tell you next week. No. <laughs> well, I don't know, but I did find the thing. I find if I look, there's a bump, bump, bump. How easy. All you need to do is push the button. Of course, find the button, right? Push it. Anyway, that's free. But sadly, this is the way so many people act today. They, 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 they choose not to admit that they're in the darkness. Oh, I escaped. We're going to make it somehow or other, right? And often that's because of pride or even insecurity to have to admit that you need help, that you are not sufficient in and of yourself. And so what, 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 what God wants you to do if you are in the darkness today is to accept Jesus. That is to follow him, to do what he says to do. He came to give his life for you. He's asking you to do the following. Let's look at this really important verse that many of you know, maybe even by heart, right? this little passage. The true light that gives light to every man was coming, that's of course Jesus, right? Was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. That has to do with part with the fact that people don't want to recognize him. He was asking for changes in their lives, and they didn't want that, okay? He came to that which was his own, his own nation. But his own did not receive him. You know, Jesus comes to many people that do, they do not receive him. He came to me many times before I finally said, yes, Jesus. Thank the Lord he kept coming, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? <laughs> and I'd say, well, <clears throat> I would say, uh, well, not now. I love my sin. That's a fact. I love my sin. 
I want to see where I am. But he kept knocking. Then he says, yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Folks, and you're a child of God. You can live in his light, in his presence. Amen. Now notice something very important. It says, yet to all who receives him, to uh, those who believe in his name. Okay? In other words, here, receiving and believing are two sides of the same coin. When I believe something, I act. Okay? If I believe that Jesus died for me, if I believe that I'm in darkness, if I believe that I need the light, I'm disoriented, and I'm lonely, and I'm afraid. I don't want you to know that, right? But you know, in counseling, that's one of, the, one of the things I see time and again. People come in, people that are very, you know, self-assured and so forth. They sit down and they open their hearts. And I'm privileged to listen to, to weakness. We're all weak, folks. There are no heroes in life. I'm not a hero. No one's a hero. Right? And so, so when we admit this, right, then we know we need a Savior and we open our lives say, Jesus Christ, you died for me. I cannot save myself. You came Christmas. I asked you to come in and to change my life. And the light comes in. Jesus, the light comes in. He illumines our being. Gives us hope and direction. And folks, instead of being disoriented, then we can have true purpose and clear direction. Instead of loneliness, we can experience deep and satisfying fellowship with our Creator. Instead of fear, we can experience security, safety. So, my question today is to you who are not sure or don't know Christ or not sure if you have invited Him into your life, would you like to do that? You know, what could be a better time to take this step than Christmas? When we remember His, his coming to the earth. In fact, it says in, a, I think it's Luke 19, uh, 1910, it says, For the Son of Man is, uh, came to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man came into this world, Jesus, to seek and to, to seek you and to save you who are lost right in the keller of your life in the basement trying to find your way around. He's the light. Open your life him, and then you will have light for life. I have a word for you who do know Jesus Christ. We're talking about the light. I just want to read a verse here. I don't have it on the screen. It says this. Listen carefully. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, it's possible as a believer in Christ to walk in sin. Yes. And if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, we're big, fat, what? Hypocrites. And unfortunately, folks, the church is full of hypocrites, right? You hear that? Oh, I don't believe the church is full of hypocrites. I, think, I always think, well, you can join them. We have to use one more, right? Yeah. But it's true. It's true, okay? But it says here, don't deceive yourself. If you're walking like a hypocrite, face it. This is wrong. This is crazy. But if we walk in the light, that is, if we submit to Jesus Christ as our Lord, as he is in the light, Jesus lives in perpetual light, right? Then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. In other words, we can confess our sins, and he cleanses us continually. That is 1 John 1, 6, and 7. 1 John 1, 6, and 7. Folks, here's a challenge for you. That you would walk in the light. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the challenge is that you would find light. That today you would say, Lord Jesus, yes, I need you. Be humble. Come on. Be humble. And if you know Jesus Christ, and you realize you're not living as he asks you to live. You're living really in darkness. Admit it. 
Confess it. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me and take control of my life. Let's bow our heads. If you have never met Jesus Christ personally, or you're not sure if you have or not, in your heart, would you just say this the following prayer? Lord Jesus, I recognize today that you are the light. And I need to walk in the light. Thank you that you died for my sins. I pray that you would now come into my heart. Forgive all my sins. Make me new. Take away the darkness. And make me a follower in the light. Thank you, Jesus. And if you do know Jesus and you haven't been walking as you should, would you say the following prayer in your heart? Lord Jesus, I repent. I'm walking in the darkness. I'm walking in sin. I pray for you to forgive me now, to take control of my life. I crown you Lord of my life right here and now. I want to walk in the light as you are in the light. Thank you, Jesus. 